Hey everyone, I'm Jordan from the NSA Media Team. I just want to thank you for making the What Have You podcast part of your weekly routine. To make it easier to keep up with each episode, the What Have You podcast will become its own channel starting in late January. To make sure you don't miss an episode, subscribe to the What Have You podcast in addition to the new St. Andrews podcast. Thanks again for listening, and enjoy the show. time i'm rachel jankovic i'm becca merkel and we're back to talk some more we're trying it's once again we're trying to do this on a thursday afternoon so we are facing perhaps mm-hmm. some of the same challenges we faced several weeks ago on our bad one mm-hmm. additionally we're in the midst of a sloppy snowstorm it's a kind of snow where it's coming down in kind of like huge frisbee sized gatherings huge because glop. it's so wet that it's just and it splats on the ground it's like the whole thing it's doing is just kind of <laughs> at you it was raining really raining all morning and then it got probably like half a degree colder and it became big. white rain <laughs> yeah but big big rain yeah but it's actually starting to gather up speed on staying on the ground right now. Yeah. So. Who knows? Anyway, so here we sit. We may have some sledding in our future. So, I would... Oh, I guess we're supposed to talk about what we've been doing. What have you been doing? Oh, I guess we're supposed to. Are we supposed to? We used what to say rules? we would. Yeah, what Who's rules in are of we us? abiding by? <laughs> Let's buck all these rules. Do you have nothing to say about what well, you've been doing? what have I been doing? Um... I think it's starting to be the same thing every week right now, so it's it's hard to really... Yeah, well, I'm trying to get back into the rhythm of school, and, and this is always... This is really funny, because I teach two lit classes, and just the way it comes out... I mean, I teach some other classes, too, but in both of the lit classes, we come back from Christmas, we're in the slop of January, it's gray, and there's no like festive holiday that we're all gearing up for so you know we're kind of all gonna settle in and into the grim midwinter and in Britlet we start reading Hamlet (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) nice for a little pick me up a little pick me up and in classical lit we commence the Greek tragedies oh perfect timing so I spend two hours a day (laughs) wading through simultaneously Hamlet and the Agamemnon and I have to say today the funniest thing happened because we read them aloud because with with plays yeah. you know they're kind of meant to be experienced in some way so it's I not that from high school and yeah, I loved it. it's not like watching it but you, you know like you're we're participating right mm-hmm. so we're going through the Agamemnon and, and of all the tragedies that we read in that little in our little unit the Agamemnon is the worst by far the toughest to get through because it's really kind of well you know it's Anyway, it's just not got it going the way, like, Oedipus mm-hmm. Rex is actually quite brilliant and stuff. And, uh, you know, so anyway, we're muscling through the Agamemnon, and, and the chorus portions, I make this, the whole class reads the chorus portions. Or, if we're in the section where it's, like, long sections where there's the strophes and the antistrophes, the guys will read one paragraph, and then the girls read one, and then the guys yeah. read one. And then you cut to the actors. Well, this class today, I was, like, wheezing. I was laughing so hard because... They got the wind in their sails, as they always do, because this is a windy class. Yeah. <laughs> They're just a hoot. And uh, <laughs> they started singing the chorus bits <laughs> to, like, random tunes. So they would be, like, smashing the words into Yankee Doodle or the ABC <laughs> tune. or And you cannot imagine how morbid it makes it because it's like the chorus singing about the butchered children slain and <laughs> they're doing it to, to, the, to the tunes of Yankee Doodle. And I have to admit it sparked a little bit more, you know, it was a little spicier than it <laughs> normally would be when we're slogging through the Agamemnon. <laughs> And I would just be like, oh, no, what are you doing now? And I don't know how they would decide amongst themselves, but they would kick off the next verse. And it'd be some, like, horrifying, like, tragic thing that they're singing about. And then oh, dear. it would come out to the, you know. Or they were they were on a Christmas kick. So a number of them were, like, um, 
deck the halls, you know, oh, that dear. kind of, yeah, it was amazing. It, it was a really hilarious thing. Anyway, at home, I'm, we're still working on our kitchen and I'm still trying to get my entryway done. And right. I'm still planning more events and, yeah. you know, that's mm-hmm. where I am. That's what I'm doing. And I'm failing to design and order the fabric for throw pillows for my living room. <laughs> so I'm still on my bread box kick for all the time, but I'm realizing something that came up in the book that I'm writing that... Which book? Is this the house cleaning mm, book yeah. from last week? Yeah, same one. Okay. I'm that, still reading it too. Good. Something mm-hmm. that came up in it that I thought was... It's funny because there's things that I'm like, oh, I've, I've actually thought about this before, but in different ways. Yeah. But she says to pay attention to your put-away style. And she says one of the biggest messes that happen for people is when their organization does not match their natural put-away yeah. style. Yeah. And she said make sure that you match that. And she said, for instance, they always hung hooks on the wall for coiled extension cords. And she said, but we are not the people who coil extension cords that we're done with. Okay. And she said, so we would end up not putting it away. We would put it on the floor to coil later. Sure. So just get So if you change it to like a bucket that you chuck your extension cord in, Uh then the messy thing is your organized thing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And actually I remember this back when, when I had more, not when I had more little kids, I had less kids, but I had less bigger kids Sure. and the, the dominant feature were the little people and at that time I had those um I had I had like the Sterilite drawer the three the little ones that Mm -hmm. are like the size of office paper I had those in the top shelf of the closet and I had them sorted by like little Lego set and there was like a little bit of Playmobil and there was little uh calico critters and one and stuff like that and so I would pull a tray out like when they had a quiet time I would they could pick a like when they were going to have a quiet time on their bed, you know? Mm-hmm. And I would say, you can pick one of the little toys. And, like, so they'd pick one, sure. and I'd pull the whole tray out and put it on their bed, and then they could play with it. And then I would pick it back up when, you know, they would pick it up. Right. But the reason that I picked that system, as opposed to a lot of different little closed bins, is that inevitably when you're sweeping and you sweep a calico critter and a Playmobil and a little mm-hmm. something, you... It needs to be the easiest thing in the world to yep. put them back where they go yep. instead of shoot. Now I have a pile of mixed things, and now yeah. I don't. This mm-hmm. and I really like the kids' toys to actually be separated by by Type. genre yeah. because that it makes it, it makes a million it more fun times to more play fun. With. Yes, yeah. and nicer yeah, to true. look at, and easier to be like, let's pull this out of the loop for right now instead of. Well, one of the things she said in this book that got me thinking, and I'm not really sure why, because I don't think I'm going to do this particular thing, but she said if you, she was talking about getting rid of stuff, and she she did hit the nail on the head for me, because I will make the pile, like, not this take is it the out. pile, well, it's like, this is the pile I want to get rid of, but it's not sorted into, this I'm going to throw away because it's old and stained, this I'm going to take to the thrift yes, store, right. this I'm going to take maybe to consignment, you know, like, yeah. And so it sits there in a pile, and I fail to move the, the whatever yeah. the pile out. And she was talking about that problem. And she said, if you just can't deal with it or you are you just can't get rid of it yet, stick it in a box and label it maybe and put it somewhere for six months. And then at the end of six months, you have to address it. And she was saying, and some, sometimes for people, they're ready to just move it down the river at that point. But that's not the point. But it made me realize... If I was going to do that and stick it, like, in the attic, I couldn't because my attic is a mess. And so I have now resolved to go and clean out my attic. And I don't think I need a maybe box. It wasn't about that. But it just gave me that, like, you know what? Because there's a lot of things that are down in the middle of my life that I really should bin up and put somewhere. But I don't really have... Our house doesn't have great storage. The attic is kind of... It's either the attic or the basement. And the attic has become a rat's nest of evil because when people Mm. when the children have things that they just don't really know what to do with they might go up and stick an attic and I don't ever go up and look so whenever I do I get this horribly demoralized feeling and I go back down again (laughs) so I think or the other thing she was talking about and I do this one too I'll save things for a yard sale but then I never have a yard sale 
So then you just have the bag yeah, of things. I, so I go in different phases. Sometimes if I know I'm going to have a yard sale, then I also start saving things. But funnier than that is if you if you really know a yard sale is coming, start pricing them while you're saving them. And mm. start... But I haven't done that in a while. No. Because it became important to me to get it out of my to-do list. But see, I was like, this is a monkey that needs to not be on my bag. No, and see, what I had for a bit was like, okay, I've been... To, or no, I put in big black garbage bags, a bunch of clothes. We went through everybody's clothes, purged stuff out, threw it in bags. It was going to be for a yard sale. I stuck them away off to the side. But inevitably... Someone will go in and be like, what's in this bag? And they'll be like, whoa, look at all these clothes. Look at that. I forgot I had And anyway, out they come again. <laughs> so. Oh, that's funny. <sighs> my, I like to move them on quickly. But this reminds me of a lot of the time in my life. I am cleaning the main areas. Like, because that's, because you're making food, cleaning up food, cleaning up the living room, cleaning up, doing laundry. I'm like in the center of the field in right. the high scoring points on the dartboard yeah that's where I am most of the time yeah but I have this rhythm where after a certain amount of time of doing that I totally ignore the whole central place mm. and I do major day of like I go through everybody's closets and pull sure. stuff out yeah. and then you can do another clean of the middle and it's yeah. like wait now everything yeah, that's now good. I know that I'm not just doing yeah. a weird... And see, I'm doing the, like, I need to start from the top of my house in the attic and work my way down to the bottom of my house in the basement. Basically, with a wheelbarrow going straight out to the truck to throw it in the back. I often, in the spring, I tend to start dreaming dreams about renting a construction dumpster. Yeah, why don't we but both go in? That's you in can my, have it. It's in my mood when I'm planning on throwing away all the furniture yeah, and everything. everything. I'm, we don't need any of this. No. What nonsense. It's much better to live We just without. need the gentle scent of ammonia in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that we really want in life anyways. So, yes, anyways. So, I'm working still on the cleaning and the rhythms of yeah, life. Yeah, me too. I am... I am working on it, but... Oh, I said that about the bread box. This is what got us on this trail. About the bread box, what I was saying is that I love it for my Bible and stuff, but I ordered a shorter little one that's white that's really, really cute. Yeah, you told us I, about this one. I did on the podcast. Yeah, you already did this oh, one. Oh, wow, nice. Well, anyways, now my next stop is I want two big white ones to go <sighs> on bedside tables because I was like, uh... what if I had one for, like, phone charging cord... Things that you tend to have, like piles of books, like, but you want them there because that's where you use that, like your chapstick or. When you say a big one, how big are we talking about? Like, you know, it's actually just kind of the one that has my Bible in it. I don't have a small Bible, so it's a decent sized leather mm -hmm. Bible, but it's stacked in there with like my leather Bible and then another big journal and then a. It's not a. I don't journal, but. I'm talking, whatever. It's a quote book, but I'm, I like that I Bob feel... Blank book. I feel worried about needing you all to know I'm not journaling every day about what I wore and what's coming <laughs> up. So anyways, and then another Bible, and then it's like a whole stack of books, and then there's still room for my pens and a whole other stack of books. Yeah, So okay. really, it's plenty of room for all the things sure. that you might wish you had right by your bed because... Interesting. Because, and I was realizing that that's a place that... I was, it was just like, oh, yeah, I should totally really just change this the routine. This is Amazon, here. right? Is that where you're Yeah, it's on Amazon. I know it's silly except for I brought up the put away style because that is exactly, it doesn't change anything because it just flips the lid open and closed. Right, it's so just right there. it's just as easy as putting it in an open, like, mm -hmm. so. And that's that's my, interesting. That's I my like next stop idea. on the bread box organizing. Yeah. I'm going to write a book called Organize your life in bread boxes. Bread boxes. <laughs> Is it smaller than a bread box? Then put Get it in. <laughs> and this is my bread box of socks. And here's my... I'm going to do the same thing, but with like wine racks. Yeah. <laughs> Like, here's what I've done. I've cut the Oh, my word. Everything. How much is that the thing about those? Like, every article that's, like, all of your household hacks that will totally change everything. Oh, my word. There might be, like, save, one in 35 that is. Save all of your duct tape roll cords. It'll be, like, it's, like, no, save twist ties from bread bags. 
<laughs> so that you can repair Christmas ornaments. So you You're can like, make what? a wind chime. It's the worst. Which is going, yeah. It's the worst. Uh-huh. Anyways, no, I don't. don't. But sometimes you run across one of those, and you're like, "Well, that was worth it. It was worth going through thirty clicking through other the whole dang slideshow trying to figure trying it out to find one thing that was a takeaway." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, give us a takeaway that you like from something like that. One of those little life hacks that you uh, that you enjoy doing. Hot. Do you have any? Uh, like well, your bread random, box, a random How about that? I guess use bread Why, do boxes. Do you have one? No, but I feel like we tell each other these all the time. I'll be uh-huh. like, you know what? I'm trying, and it's working really awesome. Yeah, we do. We do. We're that? in a constant state of tip exchanging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but whenever it comes time here to draw, I want to know. Oh, no, uh, yeah, that we can't think of them. Yeah, we cannot. Uh, oh man. Yeah. I, I feel like I should know this, but I don't right now. You know, I feel like both of us, maybe we talked about this. I'm not sure we did. Both of us kind of had our minds blown by, I I read an article on how to properly mop, and I immediately, like, called you to be like, Rach. Oh, and I, and I did it, like, while we were changed. still on the yeah. phone, I was trying and both it. of us were, like, on the phone going, oh, I love oh, how to mop. <laughs> And it's the great two bucket mopping system. The two bucket mop. Have, I do has, it every have we, Monday. Have we talked about this on I the podcast? I feel like we have. Have we? I do it every Monday and I try to do it on Thursdays. I don't know if we have. But I felt like I really always enjoy it when you figure out like there. Well, there, it's because you that. It's because I I think that that's because it was much like me learning to crochet. I hated it because I when I was learning, I don't, I don't actually know why. Maybe no one who knew was teaching me. I'm not sure. You were holding your thread too tight. No, it was just like there seemed to be no rules. Like mm. you just stab the hook in anywhere, and <laughs> out comes something. And then, and I didn't like it because I felt like, well, how do I know I went through the right hole? Sure. How do I? And I talked to someone who was like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. And I'm like, it must. I mean, like, how can it not matter? And, like, I just really, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing wrong, but I was sure I was doing stuff wrong. And I, I, there's a lot of things in life where you feel like there is actually the right way to do this. And that that has been lost probably through many tips and things. It has been lost until... I felt like I didn't actually know the right way to mop a floor. You you have yeah. a zillion different methods or ideas. Well, okay, this is long. This is related. I am working up to the mopping thing. I have always had a thing about washing dirty dishes in a sink full of water because I think it's so disgusting to have horrid, dirty, sloppy, greasy water that you have all of your all of your dishes in. Like so. I have had many years of not having a dishwasher in my life, but I never fill the sink with water and with all the dirty dishes in it because I just find it kind of gross. And I feel like the same has always been true of mopping for me. Like your mop bucket is so disgusting and you put your mop in it and then you get that water out and then you smear it all over your floor. And it always felt to me like, how is this an improvement? Like it gets the sticky stuff off or whatever. But, I always feel but like, it's like using the color really... of your mop water, it, it's hard to not take it as a direct personal insult. Yes. Where but you're like, like, stop saying that about me. If you had like a really <laughs> gunky, nasty sponge and you went to wipe down the dining room table with it, that's what it always felt like to me. So when I finally had this eureka moment about the mopping, but I think the two bucket was an innovation that you and I came up with out of this article about mopping. So no. yeah, it was. Yeah, it was because I don't think. Yeah, so. it was. I'm pretty positive because I, I remember Surely calling not. you like, "Here's the good idea that I have." Like this is this is like the I don't lady. think we made that up. I'm What's pretty saying? sure because I was right off the bat. I remember being like, "Where's another bucket? I need no, another bucket." No, because that's what I was calling you to say. Like, what if we did it with two? So the thing mm-hmm. is, is you get like a string. This, I'm mop. confident that this is not our innovation. Well, I'm not saying we're the only ones who have thought That's of it. That's all right. I'm Let's just go ahead and that, tell like, the people. The original they don't article. Care about no, they who don't patented care. it. Who gets the footnote? So who gets the glory for the yeah, two bucket that mop nameless, system? That nameless article that I found. No, it's like where you get your hot soapy water in a bucket and you get your string mop. And that's the thing is it's a string mop. It's not one of those sponge mops. And then you 
fill your mop with water, but you do not wring it out. No, stop. You fill your buckets halfway full with hot, one with soapy water, one with clear water. Yeah, okay, you, you Then tell you it. dip the mop in the soapy water. Yep. And you don't wring it out. You just slop the hot, soapy water straight in on. And onto the floor in an area. If you're in the a hurry, like, the bigger the area. Yeah, but you kind of are going for like, or maybe a square yard. Yeah, it's not that much, but yeah. but I go for more than that often because I have more water. Yeah, because you've got like a so, full mop drippy work. And it, it's hot, and I love seeing my floor steam. Okay, at yeah. this phase. Yeah, and so you you swab it all around, spreading it out. Then you rinse the mop out and wring it out in the clear water. In the clear water, which will no longer be clear. And then you. Ring the ring mop it all out. The way out. You wring it out, and then you go back to soak up all of the water that you slopped. But because the hot water has been sitting there on the floor, it like soaks any little yeah. grungy things. So when you pick it so all up, it actually picks second. up. Yeah, yeah, it picks it all up. But it also, I keep finding milk stains appear in the water that I didn't know were on the floor. It's weird. Like yeah. it turns milky again. Anyways, so then you swap pick it the all up, up. Then you rinse it again. Then you go back but to you the... But wring it out. Rinse wring it, wring it, it out. It out then dip it in the soap. Then soap on the floor. But the then... thing is, is that then you wrung out all the dirty water into your cast-off bucket. Yes. And then you put it into the clean water bucket and you put right. it on the so floor what, again. Right, so what ends up happening is I have a bucket full of filthy rinsed yeah. mop bucket. And then, but the soapy water is still clear. Yeah, or, you know, it gets a little well, bit tainted. Yeah, but it's nowhere but near it's what the... But it's not nearly as bad. Yeah. So you continue to put nice water on the floor, wring it out and in your cast-off bucket, then soak the water back up, put it right. in your bad bucket. And so then, I do it. I yeah. do this on Mondays, and then I try to do a Thursday, like a light mopping version. Today's Thursday, and I'm not doing it, so that's how much I stand by that rule. <laughs> but I try, if I do it, to, that I cover a bigger area when I do it. Like, See, I do, like, a instead of more scrubby in one area, I only... Usually, when I do it, I have to change the bucket, like, one or two times yeah, to yeah. on the main. Right. And if I do a quick mop, I don't change but it But I just... Much. Something about that, like, just putting the nice clean soapy water on the floor and picking all the gross water up and keep keeping what it one sold, place. What sold me on oh. this was when I spilled something on the floor shortly after and wiped it up with a paper towel and it was not dirty. Yeah. I was and like, see, what? The thing is, what? Like I had years and years ago, I bought one of those. It looks like a vacuum, but it's like for mopping floors where you fill the tank with soapy water and it was supposed to always clean with the clean water and then all the gross water comes into a canister that you then dump out. And and the thing that I appealed to me about it was the yeah. fact that you could just throw the dirty water away. But it was foul and disgusting and depraved that mop water was. It was so gross. And I feel like it broke fairly soon and it was just Yeah. You know, so anyway. I'd like to point out how long we've been talking about this because it's really easy for us to talk I know. at interminable length about things like this. So, <laughs> but notice we didn't draw any morals from it, but we could. Can we think Would of you any, like us to? any metaphors about yes. the dirty stuff? I have. Water? Okay, here's a good one. Here's a good one. This is about why you need to read your Bible yourself. Instead of, <laughs> instead of being women who only apply scripture that filtered down to them through several people who are reading their Bibles and someone finally wrote a blog post. Or put it on a print, Pinterest printable. Yeah. Or I read that article. I don't know how you're tying that to mop water. I'm talking about go straight to the clean water source. Oh, not sure. yeah. not to the, you yeah, know, let it all get muddied. And then, mm-hmm. well, that reminds me of something. And I think Dad shared an article about empathy that was awesome. And it was an amazing article. But I just of, saw the title was great. It was Empathy is Not Charity. Yeah, but this is this was a takeaway that I thought was crazy. It said that it's been proven that empathy is something that you can exercise to have grow. That you can grow your empathy. Okay. Like you can become a more and more empathetic person by exercising it constantly. Okay. The article makes some great points about how because we're Trinitarian, we do believe in unity and brotherly love. But we have a clear definition of where I end and you begin. Okay. Like we actually believe that there that we can be separate people that are still tied together. Okay. And but one of the things that the article said that I was like I thought was incredible was that it's been shown that nurses so a hard and a position that yeah. you know 
requires much charity and kindness and consideration uh-huh. of people. That nurses who are more empathetic, like, that they, do, whatever, tracked some uh-huh. nurses who are very empathetic by nature, end up spending more time trying to be comforted themselves than taking uh-huh. care of the patients. Uh-huh. I was like, going to say it would cripple that, you. It does, because because they, if you're taking on the burden, you're not... You're no, you're like, yeah. you're also the person in it who needs help instead yeah. of being a person who can actually give it yeah. and is equipped to do that. It was a, it was a great article. I, yeah, it's that's interesting. Uh, well worth the read, but that's oh, cool. well, the thing that we were going to talk about that I was going to talk about, well, we were going to talk about it, but we talked about it in our super duddy episode. So yeah. we want to see if we she can do it in a split. Yeah, John. I'm sorry guys. Sorry. <laughs> It's the heat in this car. It's I should not. Turn it's this cozy. Down. I'm feeling no, cozy. No, Becca likes a hot air balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cozy. Yeah, you, you are. You've got your seat heater on. You could turn that off if you oh, don't like Oh, I should. It. That's how you, that's the thing about these hot seats. You forget yeah, that you're in them. I do love right. a hot seat. So anyways, Avista is our power company here. And She's naming names now, It's a guys. local kind. Yeah, I assume that Avista is only doing this because of some dumb government regulation or something about helping us all be oh yeah more green but anyways they send out these letters periodically rating you on your eco-friendly like performance public shaming but slightly less public private public shaming yeah but they're but they send it to you and and it's it comes like across, every time it's so judgy pants it, but, but it comes across like letters that say i know your secret yes and the, and the <laughs> funny part about it to me is that they're like Instead of the fruit basket we obviously should have sent you for being our best customer, we're sending you a snark. Like, yeah, we're sending says, you a rude remark. Well, they compare you. They say, like, compared to all the other people on your block, compared you, to all of your neighbors. Yeah. You, you are the worst. 3,000% more energy than they do. <laughs> you are number 100 well, out of 100 customers. We always win. We oh, universally. See, we, uh, clear out the neighborhood. So do we, on but I suspect Avista is making things up because everyone I know is told that they're the worst on the block. So, But I think everyone we know probably is the worst on the block. Well, it's possible. I think that we are in a, in a high energy output group. And the reason is because, so for instance, I'll get these reports from our neighborhood and they're like out of 100 houses or yeah. something. Yeah, so you're like number your number, you're the one that tops the charts. Like we can't even hear notes that high. That's <laughs> that's what they send us these messages. But it's so funny because it means we provided more service to you than anyone else. No, no, we didn't. You paid us. Yeah, that's you what paid I mean. us for more power. Yeah. So like, why are they complaining? And and I just like to point out that Avista is water power, which is it is energy that is coming from. The Spokane River and some other river areas, I'm assuming, because Idaho is a river state. It's a very renewable energy source. (laughs) It's not like we're burning coal over at our house. (laughs) (laughs) They're not like, have you noticed that we had to bring you six semis full of coal this month? We would have noticed. You're turning the neighborhood black with Yes, you're ruining everything. But (laughs) instead, they just send us these little malicious... Like monthly reports on how bad we are at things, and I don't, I don't really care. I no. really can't say I care. Although sometimes I look at it and I'm like, what, like what, Avista? Because I'm like, you know, in the, in our neighborhood, I'm like, oh well, there's the two houses that I've never seen anyone at ever in my home. Like I don't know if anyone belongs there. Right. Then there's the overseas missionary vacant home next to us. Then there's the one that never has a light on and is often gone for long periods of time. And there's a little lady around the corner who I don't even know her, but I love her for, I think she had like 11 kids and she lives by herself now. She's a widow, but there are always tons of people. There's like tons of traffic, like different people mowing her lawn and different people showing up and like on holidays, cars everywhere. Like I love it. But her normal garbage day is one little plastic bag from the grocery store with a knot tied on it out on the curb. Yeah. And I'm like, what? We have yeah. much more garbage. But anyways, about back to these missives that Avista sends us to shame us. The thing that bothers me about them, which aside from the dumb government regulations and whatever that's driving them to do this 
to us. But the thing that bothers me is that they're trying to shame you on something that is a totally false measurement in the first place. Yeah. So they're saying you're the least efficient. Yeah. That's the out word of all that of they your used. out of all of your neighbors, you are the one who is not at all efficient. Yeah. And this is the word that they're using. And this is that my fundamental beef with this is that you're saying efficient, but efficiency you have to have more data points to know and the data point that they're missing. They know how much energy we are expending. Right. But they have no idea what we're doing with it. They don't know what they're the not saying like yeah, they're not saying like out of one hundred neighbors who also baked forty loaves of bread and mm-hmm. fed ten people thirty times and did this and had yeah. another group over and dried how many hundreds of pairs of pants have I dried in one month? Yeah. You know, like the the way we're using our energy, you can't measure the efficiency of no, it. No, it's like saying you used seven gallons of gas, therefore you're a gas hog. When this person only, only used one. But it's like, actually, you need more data. You need to know how far did you drive. You have to know what the purpose was. What did we accomplish with this so, energy to know if it so was efficient or not. Miles per gallon is a meaningful it's that is a meaningful statistic. Distance covered for the fuel that for you For the took. fuel. But when you just look at merely the fuel, you have no idea if you're being efficient right. or not efficient. And the reason that I brought this up is because this in case I don't you missed actually it, guys, care that much about the electrical no, side of life. It's a metaphor, guys. It's a metaphor. But the but the but people do care about this and you it's easy to think that you're being inefficient because you spend a lot on your heating bill or you're inefficient because your food budget is way higher than a single woman's. Or you're inefficient because your laundry pile is big. Yes, or or you say, it's like saying, well, the most efficient way to keep your toothbrushes in order is to stop using them. (laughs) Like, and and it's perfectly accurate that that is the most efficient way to not mess up your toothbrushes and to keep them in the same places to never use it. But it, but... What value is that to you? So the point is not the Avista, but basically like it's easy to measure your own achievements in the same in exact way. In a completely false light. Where and you're the, looking at like my living room never got messed up once. That would be true housekeeping. Like yeah. that would be my, my right. best job but doing that. Which is that. basically like saying if I parked the car in the driveway, it would be the most fuel efficient. Well, and it, it, and it would. would be, but it sort of. Well, <laughs> it would be the cheapest. It would be the it would be the way to not use any fuel. That's what it would be the way to do. Right. And the thing that that God gave us these tools to do things with, like, and that it's it's funny because out of all the houses that they're measuring me against, like I don't know, I don't think many of them have a mom who's home all day. Well, like I've they always, don't have people in their house all day. I have people in the house in the oven going. That's one of the and things I've always the dryer wondered. going and like they have no idea how many people are in this home. No. How much like nothing. Or even if you were measuring the same like this house has two people in it and this house has two people in it. But one of them you have somebody home all day and the other one both people are at work all day. Well, they're both using energy. It's just not being one measured right One of them is right on here. the office yeah, bill. One, yeah, yeah, it's showing up somewhere else. Yeah. That's not really the point, though. The point is not so much about Avista and the gas bill. No, I find it funny of Avista, but my point is that, like, one time my husband said about uh, this about something. I don't remember. It might have been when I was reading and talking with him about reading the life-changing magic, you know. Yeah. That one. And it was like, you know, it's just this... I really think it's just idolatry, but it's just the idolatry of thinking that something reflects some kind of value on yourself. Like, like where you're like, look in this kitchen drawer and see how streamlined and simple and orderly this is. And he said, I think it was about that, but I don't know. But anyways, Luke's comment was like, I really don't care how organized all the kitchen drawers look. Tell me what kinds of things you're making. Like, and, and it was a metaphor when he said that not just about the food but about with the kids and about other things it's like what fruit are you getting and that that is the whole point of the fuel in the first place like the whole reason god gave us these tools and this energy and this stuff to use is for us to do things with it it's yeah. like the talent and many, in the ground yeah, how many of jesus's parables are focused on that exact thing about like you've been given this amount 
Now show me what you're going to do with it. Show me the increase. And you're like, what I'm going to do with it is absolutely nothing. <laughs> I'm going to nothing. bury it in the ground. Nothing, Lord. So I'm going to come back. You're going to come me. back and you'll find out that we kept all the lights off the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> we sat right. around in the dark because doom. Because we confused what efficiency means. Right. And I think I just, it's relevant in your life. Whatever you're doing is just thinking, wait. Like efficiency is a great thing to think about because the whole the whole concept is not wasting your time, not wasting your yep. whatever. Yep. But you can only know that if you actually know what the fruit is if and you're what the purpose is. Productivity as well as Right. So for yeah. instance, if I was in a real habit of napping the day away or if I like to go turn the kiln on with nothing in it. <laughs> or just ran the oven for ambiance with nothing going through it. Then maybe I would need to be convicted about that. But the reality is that you're like, if you're just working all the time, trying to be faithful, yeah. that you don't need to be measuring yeah. with a lot of pained expressions. But also how is, bad you I look think... in the neighborhood. <laughs> no. And there was, um, I, I do think oftentimes there's a bit of a panic that everybody has about there's this like fixed amount of resource and the more I use the quicker we're going to run out you know like Mm -hmm. I think that that's the thing that people that people stress out about and then they get kind of shamed into well Well, like if I had my lights on that I it's like I took it from someone in a third world country and used it forever oh one of my favorites was there was a little advertisement in England about if you leave your office light on all night I can't remember. It measured the amount of energy you used. You could have heated like 2,000 cups of tea or 20,000 cups of tea. I don't know. But I can't, I always looked at that and I was like, but it's not like 2,000 <laughs> cups of tea went unheated because you kept your light on. <laughs> okay, you had one job to turn off your light so we could have tea. <laughs> and I don't mind people turning their light off. It's just that I think that there is a funny sleight of hand people do. And it's, again, it's not about fuel or energy, you know, like No, but this fuel. ties in with people treating kids as consumers instead yes. of producers. Uh-huh. That right, when your kids are little, they are consumers. That's primarily what you're doing is feeding uh-huh. them and growing them up. But that that's not their... People are not strictly consumers. Right. They produce things. So you're not like... It's not like the imprint of a child on the world is the imprint of like one more taker. Well, it's like, well, what, one more giver. What is it to what say with two says, hands, right? Yeah, dad's thing about like we're all born with one mouth and two hands. Yeah. Like we do, we are consumers, but we are also producers. And, and I think the point is, is to be a producer, you know, because by definition, and and not to be feeling guilty about the fact that you have to eat while you are working. But again, like if, if you're being wildly inefficient, truly inefficient, like nothing gets done, then, you know, if you use seven miles, seven gallons of gas and you only got down the block... It's that just, actually is I very can tell you. I can tell you about a time that I wasted gas. I'll tell you. Tell me. So, Luke came home. No, who among us can, is really at fault? This was a while ago, and it was very funny. And now, I hope I can remember the details now that I'm trying to tell it. Luke ran home for lunch. Okay. Something came up. Like, maybe it was a kid needed to be picked up or something. You know, like, something changed the plan. Mm-hmm. We decided to go together yeah, to get this child. So we took the other car. He came home in the Sequoia. We took the other car. Then he needed to get back to the office, so I just dropped him off. Yeah. Then I went, like, <laughs> to mom's and, like, to the grocery store, came home, unloaded the car, put the kids down for a nap, was making dinner. So at this point, it's like 5.30, and he came home at like 12, maybe. And I went outside for something and realized that his car was still running. That he (laughs) had pulled up in front of our house at lunchtime and just run in for something when we changed the plan and we left leaving the car running. And that I came home and, and... Kate made several trips out to the car right past the running car and didn't notice it. But so that was a time that we were not that fuel used, efficient. Well, we were like going time, nowhere and it was not worth the expense. It's like the time we left town for like three days 
and our front door <laughs> was not locked. We didn't lock it. And on purpose or not on purpose? Well, it's just, you know, it's the kind of town we live in, you know. It's like Yeah. We might lock the door, but we might not. And uh-huh. in this case we didn't. But our door has a funky latch on it, and so it uh unless you really give it a particular slam, it doesn't actually latch. So we came home from a three day, four day journey mm. to find our front door flung wide wide open <laughs> and there's no screen on it there, there, there was yeah within? there Have was done no it all? screen so it was, was your just, second door closed i think so on the other hand i felt like what would deter burglars more than that because <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't think that anyone would be actually Don't burgle out here. of town when they left their door flung wide but anyway yeah, who knows if we had the heater on but a Vista probably would have had words with us if we did. Oh, they would have. They probably would have had a word with you. Exactly. All right, so do you have a book recommend? Oh, a book recommend. Well, the Agamemnon, for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, sing it. The Yankee try and, Doodle. They give yourself sing, a little pick-me-up. Like, Greek tragic, you know, The, the Greek tragedies bits. are just the pits. Some of them are kind of genius because Oedipus is... Oh, I just remember Antigone. Antigone. I write a paper about... Oh, and taking me, and it's just what was your yawning? I'm still? sorry, it's puts good. me right out. It's good. So Antigone, though, it's just like really now, except for Oedipus. Think about this well, for Oedipus a is worse. Just, no, it's not. I think it's actually very clever because you have. I mean, it's sad no, and hideous and grotesque. Pits. It is the pit. It's but think of it from the perspective of a detective story, which it really is, because it opens with Oedipus as the detective trying to solve the murder in the city that is yeah. causing this plague and he's trying to solve it and he's gathering witnesses and he's you know doing all this stuff and he himself is the murderer and he doesn't know he doesn't know it. but the he... thing is everyone in the crowd already does and so the just the kind of horror of like seeing it gradually like fall down the okay, stairs but but it's but it's hideous as he becomes more and more suddenly like wait wait and it turns out it's him in the end. But it's but, the worst. Yeah, but clever. I mean, think like having clever. the detective turn out to be the criminal and he didn't know. Like, that's I think actually having, not bad. having the detective turn out to have married his mother and killed his father without knowing he did that either is a, of those things. That is a... That's dark. It's a dog. That is like the special sea of darkness <laughs> that only the Greek tragedies could have picked well, up Well, <laughs> the Greek tragedies, they did. They went... They went deep into some of those horrid places. But I'm just saying, well, okay, so in the golden age of detective fiction, which was like between the world wars in England. Mm-hmm. That would have been like Dorothy Sears, Agatha Dorothy Christie. Dorothy Sears, Agatha Christie, G.K. Chesterton, you know, mm-hmm. you, and they had this group of them that would get together in London for a supper club. Wouldn't and that they have were, been just so fun? Yeah. To and they get were, to listen in on this. Yeah, us. and they yeah. were called... They called themselves the Detection Club, I think. And they would come and read their stories and stuff. But they came up with the Ten Commandments that they all had to abide by. Well, and then there was this hilarious oath that they had to swear as, like, admittance into the Detection Club. Mm. And their oath was written probably either by Chesterton or Sayers. And it has something about, I hereby swear that my detective shall well and truly use the wits I bestow upon him or, you know, something like that. Uh Not using, I think, jiggery pokery, feminine intuition or acts of God or something like he can't solve his crimes by means of anyway. Interesting. these, These 10 commandments, they're actually really great because they were treating, they were treating writing detective stories as sort of a game. And these are the rules of the game. And it's easy to write a mystery, but it's hard to unravel it without cheap tricks. Uh-huh. Well, so, it's the classic, like, it's the... <laughs> so, one of the rules, one of the Ten Commandments, is that you cannot have twins or doubles unless the reader has been suitably prepared for them. So, you can't just suddenly You can't be like, a, guess what? It's what like, it? haha. I was going to say, because isn't that a Father Brown that has the twins? Well, you can have twins if... It, if, if everyone knows they're prepared. twins. But the thing is, like, they're trying to eliminate, like easy outs for the author yeah. and which are also frustrating for the reader because it's like yeah, you couldn't you know, possibly couldn't have, have guessed. That. Luke and I watched a show one time that was I, I don't even remember what the name of it was but for whatever reason it it actually 
hooked us in the like, how are they going to make this yeah. work? Like, and yeah. and you really were like, I need to know right. the explanation of this. Like, yeah. this is magically weird. Like, yeah. what happened? And you're like waiting to yeah. find out. And they actually pulled the like, it was all a dream. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Like, and then I woke up, and, it, and we were like. You're telling me that the authors never knew how they were going to no. fix it. No, because like, it was obviously a last-minute uh-huh. effort to just yeah. sort of change the subject. So the detection club, they were trying to make rules so that the author had to be legitimately clever in how they saw the right. crimes. So they had, like, you can't have twins. You're, you're allowed one secret passage or hidden room, but no more. Per you, story? Per or, story. Uh, okay. Yeah. You can't... It said... And then one of them is the detective himself cannot commit the crime. Mm. So I'm like, see, Oedipus is like the earliest detective story. Uh-huh. And, and he is the criminal, which is interesting. But yeah, it's all stuff where it's... They're eliminating the, the frustrating little... Or one is like, you can't have the uh, person be killed by any, like, hitherto undiscovered poisons. Uh-huh. Or... Anything that requires a long scientific explanation at the end. Nice. Well, <laughs> something funny. that I feel like needs to come up because of what you said and because of what I said earlier about empathy is that how that has ruined much of our like popular level crime um, fiction or movies, like the crime shows. Okay. And the reason that we like won't watch them or can't tolerate them generally if we do watch part of one is that the increased like now there's this major disrespect for rule of law due process how like and they they constantly are showing cops that you're supposed to sympathize with not following the law because they know this is a bad guy or this is someone like the ultimate evil in our society now is the criminal that got away with something uh, hmm. because people were following the rules. So I believe it's because there's all this empathy that it's like a majorly empathy driven um, thing where you feel so bad for the victim that you can't possibly let like, I, I'm not saying it's always like that, but the point is that they commonly have you try to, they commonly are trying to get you to be on the side of what really is a completely corrupt detective. Interesting. Or cop. Um, <laughs> where And completely corrupt because they're doing whatever they think is right. Not so, enforcing laws that have centuries of yeah. of reasons and backup. Do you know what I mean? Like where they're like, right. well, it's neither here nor there. So this is sort of tangential to that. But um, <coughs> we had an assembly today at school and it was um, Toby Sumter came and gave the talk on confession of sin and there was one part that I thought was so profound that he was he was saying uh, he's talking about Psalm 51 where David is saying is it 51 where he says against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight and it's like but surely surely David surely you did something for Uriah did something to Uriah surely seems like it would have been a rough slog but he says against you and you only and he really camped on this point for quite a while to say like the fact that we are sinning against God and not like we have affected others with our sin and yes we can have victims on a horizontal level but primarily the offense is against God Mm -hmm. and he said this is the thing that separates Christian confession from pagan apologies and he said, and it's because pagans, they apologize to each other all the time, but it's, they can only see things on a horizontal level of like, they messed up the relationship somehow. So now they have to put it right. right. And he said, but the problem with that is if sin is only defined by the relational aspect, mm-hmm. then basically it's, it's ever changing and you can't ever really fix it because how can you ever know when right. you've done enough to put it right? And he said it makes you at the mercy of everybody's feelings. They felt like you did something bad. They felt like their feelings and, were and hurt. And so you they have to continue like a victim. to, yeah. And if and you say said, no against you and you only have I've sinned, then you know then exactly. Then it's very fixed. Yeah. It's a fixed point. And he's like, but this is why we have... And I was just thinking, oh man, like the fact that we've removed God is why feelings are the queen of the town they really are like if you hurt somebody's Mm -hmm. feelings and you don't even have to have legitimately done anything 
<clears throat> but if their feelings are hurt, then right. you are by definition guilty because that's the only measuring stick we have is whether someone's feelings were hurt. Right. I was like, oh, that is that is actually so true. That as soon mm-hmm. as you, as soon I as you eliminate that. I always thought that was interesting that. about about David and Bathsheba, anyways, because he apparently goes on to just she's just one of his wives mm-hmm. for forever afterwards. Well, and an ancestor, ancestress of Christ. Yeah, but I mean, she's. It's just is an interesting. Yeah. It's just an interesting kind of like, like um, I think it's not that it is an excuse for Christians to live in sin or something, but I'm saying that because it was like against you and you only have I sinned, that reconciliation with God, forgiveness with that makes going forward in life possible. Yeah, and when and you, it's like and forgiveness when it comes from God, it's a like we know what the promise is and so forth when it's. We have to just wait until the other person extends forgiveness. Right. And he said, that's how you end up with people who say things like, but I still feel hurt. I still feel like. Strangely, you did not make it go yeah, away like with your apology. You said you're sorry, but I'm still mad. I still feel wounded. I still. And so there's no. It's like, never enough. Well, you're completely at the mercy of the feelings of someone else rather than objective, right. you know. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, I thought that was really good. That is really good. But here we are. It's 50 minutes. All right. We gotta it's time go. to we be gotta, done. We've got to wrap this puppy up. It's good visit. We didn't, we didn't recommend something. You recommend something. I'm reading, nope, on audio. I'm listening to the book right now to say nothing of the dog. And it is making me laugh oh, a yeah. lot. Have yeah. you read it? I have, but it was a long time ago. And, and it's it was actually, very funny. It's a very funny book. I was like, so yeah. far, it was nothing like what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I, I don't know what I did think it was, but I gave it to Lena for Christmas, and then I was like, hey, I should listen to that. Yeah. But now I've been getting a real kick out of it. I, I think, think we gave is, it to Dad a few years ago like, for Christmas. This is pretty truly witty. Yeah. Did he read nothing it? Of the dog. Yeah, I think so. It's pretty funny. Unless it was Three Men in a Boat. Well, Three Men in a Boat is somehow so, related yeah, to it. Is, it. To but it's not the same. The dog. It's but it's the not, subtitle. Isn't it? No, it? no. Three Men in a Boat no. is by a different author, but it's mentioned many times yeah, in this one, it. and it is three. I think that somehow it got tied in with, uh, with it. Okay, I'm looking because now I'm Three Men in a Boat. The bottom of it's it is uh, no because to say nothing of the dog is or how we found the bishop's no, bird stump. Three Men in a Boat in parentheses to say nothing of the dog. I know, but then I think that I think that. Three mm-hmm. men in a boat. This is by Jerome K. Jerome. Yeah. I feel like in in to say nothing of the dog. There's a lot of references to to the three men mm-hmm. in a boat. Well, maybe. and it's by someone named Connie Willis, I think. Okay, that's funny. So I there was there must be a story here that we're missing. Yeah, I was thinking of this one. Um. Yeah, I guess the one that I have is is the one is this one by Connie Willis that it is to say nothing of the dog and then I think that the subtitle is how we found the bishop's bird stump at last okay that is not the one that I thought you were talking about I well it it's was... quite funny so I'm recommending it without having gotten to the end of it it's quite good okay that's all right funny talk to you all that well, oh, did you have a recommend no I'm you, you only can... one from me none how from about Becca? three men in a boat yeah we don't know the, <laughs> we don't know the difference between our recommends sure. no, but the we'll recommends find out. are a little hazy all right talk to you later Bye.